Hello and welcome to the France 24 interview. Our guest today is Olivier de Schutter. He is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. He joins us from Brussels. Thank you very much for being with us today. My pleasure. Thank you. So you were appointed this spring, right in the midst of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, you issued a, a report in September about the impact of the pandemic on social protection systems. Uh, I want to uh, begin uh, with the issue that's been pretty much in the news, the issue of the vaccine uh, and its distribution worldwide. We've seen countries, starting with the United States, uh, wanting to have their population vaccinated uh, first. Is this really a worries uh, for poor countries not having immediate access to the vaccine? Well, there are two issues here, but obviously it is a concern that rich countries have preempted the global production of vaccines. Oxfam filed a report showing that 51% of the vaccines had been pre-bought by countries representing 13% of the global population. And that may be um, a very bad signal because poor countries with low purchasing power may be, as a result, um, unable to afford the vaccine for themselves. So that is one issue. Who shall be able to pay for the vaccine? And this is linked to a debate on intellectual property rights. Um, South Africa and India have requested that we waive intellectual property rights on vaccines in order to ensure access uh, of developing countries to those technologies, to those vaccines, um, using the flexibilities that the WTO should, should provide. So I think it's a very important debate and, and we should not allow purchasing power to decide whom gets a right to be treated. Right. Uh, I want to go back, I would say, to, to the core of your work since your uh, appointment, uh, the impact of uh, COVID-19 on uh, countries, especially poor countries. And there are some really troubling uh, figures. Uh, you estimate that almost 180 million more people will fall into extreme poverty. How is this uh, possible after years of improvement on this front of the fight against extreme poverty? Well, indeed, this is a major setback uh, against the efforts to reduce poverty that were making progress and paying off in recent years. And the reason is that developing countries simply cannot afford, uh, for the moment, to, to strengthen social protection and protect their population from the shock. Paradoxically, although rich countries are worst hit by the economic recession in terms of the reduction of GDP in rich countries, it is in developing countries that the impacts shall be the worst. And that is because these countries depend very heavily on exports of raw commodities to rich countries. And the price of these commodities has gone down on global markets as a result of the crisis. It's also because these countries have a very high level of debt and they cannot borrow money at affordable rates in order to finance social protection. It's also in these countries that we find a very large number of people working in the informal sector or in precarious forms of employment and therefore who are not protected by social protection. And finally, these are countries that depend to a significant extent on remittances from migrant workers that represented in 2019 some 500 billion US dollars. This is three times the total amount of official development assistance. So it's very significant. And these remittances have gone down significantly as a result of the crisis. So right. these countries right. now are without resources to really support their population. Right. And uh, as a result, I mean, one of the uh, sustainable development goals, as they are known, stipulates that the proportion of people living in poverty should be more than half uh, than halved, sorry, by 2030. Does this mean that this goal is now impossible? Well, we are not going to reach this goal. And in any case, uh, let us be very clear, the measure of extreme poverty under the first sustainable development goal, which is to, to eradicate global poverty, is really ridiculous. It's a measure that um, is based on the 1.90 US dollar per day per person uh, benchmark or baseline. And that is um, absolutely meaningless. Uh, it means, for example, that you are not considered extremely poor in Portugal if you have more than 1.41 euro per day to spend. Now, it's ridiculous. Nobody can survive in Portugal with 45 euros per month. So I believe we have to take much more realistic figures 
to really assess the progress or the lack of progress in the fight against poverty. And um, yes, this crisis will mean a significant um, um, uh, increase in the figures, but the global figures of progress are not very meaningful, frankly. Right. Uh, what is more worrying, in addition to those numbers that are in dispute, as just, you just pointed out, is that there are some quite concrete phenomena that are already probably reappearing because uh, those millions, those tens of millions, hundreds of millions, are falling into extreme poverty. This means child labor, uh, including slavery in some, in some countries, especially uh, women are very exposed. I mean, how worried are you? Are you seeing this already appear? Well, very clearly, the, the lockdown that has been affecting many economies over the past uh, uh, six to eight months uh, have been disproportionately affecting women. Um, not only because women were mostly in precarious forms of employment and were a majority of the informal workers that are poorly protected by, by social protection, but also because when schools close down and when public services are shut down or reduced as a result of the crisis, um, women um, uh, shoulder the, the additional burden that falls on, on families. And therefore, women are absolutely disproportionately affected by the crisis. And, um, and children, um, um, when schools close down, do not have access to meals that are provided in, in schools and sometimes are the most important meal of the day for children, but also they may drop out from schools. And, and the resurgence of child labor is the result of some 368 million children um, not attending school uh, during the lockdowns, uh, all regions uh, c c uh, together considered. And, and that is a very significant setback in, in these areas. Right. I mean, obviously, uh, you're the rapporteur on extreme poverty and on uh, human rights. Are you seeing uh, through this uh, pandemic uh, really an erosion of uh, those uh, basic rights? I mean, uh, you're in charge more of a right to housing, right to food and things like that. But are, are you worried that there could be an erosion that could be a lasting one, not just during the, the pandemic, but could remain for years or decades? Look, it's true that the restrictions that are imposed by governments have sometimes been challenged as excessive uh, restrictions to the freedom to move or the freedom to, to work uh, um, and, and to develop normal activities. Um, but it can also be an opportunity to rethink the role of social protection in our, in our societies. And what we, we need to do now is to ensure that we build back better, we build more resilient societies in the future by strengthening social protection programs. What we've seen over the past few months is a very large amount of social protection measures that were adopted by governments. But very often these measures are short term for the duration of the crisis or the duration of the lockdowns without uh, governments uh, taking the risk of protecting the populations with standing rights-based social protection schemes. And that is what we need to do. We need to ensure that all individuals, women, men, and children, are protected throughout their lives with basic income security guarantees. And that is the idea of social protection floors that should be made universal. And we need to support low-income countries in particular much more significantly in order to allow them to protect um, their populations. This is affordable. The ILO has calculated that it would take no more than 78 billion US dollars to make up for the financing gap that low-income countries face, making it difficult for them to provide their population with social protection floors. 78 billion dollars is only half official development assistance uh, figures of 2019. So it's perfectly affordable if we decide to make this a political priority. Right, because uh, through this crisis, and this will be uh... Uh, the end of the interview soon, uh, we've seen governments, especially in uh, rich countries, throw a lot of money uh, to help the economy, to help the social protection system, because for years there was this idea that you couldn't spend that much, you couldn't uh, pile more debt. But this is out of the window now. I mean, or do you think that this could last and help rebuild a new system? Well, completely. All the taboos have fallen as a result of the crisis. And altogether, governments have injected some $12,000 billion in the economy, which is entirely unprecedented. Now, 
Part of this money was for social protection. It's a very minor part, about $600 billion, which is one twentieth of the total economic stimulus packages adopted. But what is most uh, troubling is that most of this money was invested by rich countries for their populations. Again, poor countries, low-income countries cannot afford to do as much, and therefore we need to build their capacity to protect their, their population, and we need to launch a new international solidarity mechanism. This is why with others, in particular the French government, we have proposed a new global fund for social protection to provide support to countries in need who cannot face this crisis given their inability to have access to international finance. Just a very last question. Are you hopeful that the Biden administration will be more responsive on those issues? Well, clearly multilateralism that was put between parentheses uh, over the past four years by the US is back. And I very much hope that the Biden administration shall be working collaboratively with the UN to find solutions to problems that show the interdependence of countries. We cannot address this crisis um, acting unilaterally. Um, if the situation is not safe in one country, no other country will be safe and we have to combat this pandemic together. Olivier de Schutter, I want to thank you very much uh, for being with us here on the France 24 interview and thank you for watching it. They're known for their cuisine and saying hello with a kiss. They only work 35 hours per week, when they're not on strike, that is. How true are these clichés about France? Every week, Florence Villeminot tears apart stereotypes. Join us for insight into French culture and current events to understand what makes the French so unique. French Connections, presented by Florence Villeminot on France 24 and France24.com.